And we're back. Episode 2, The Melbourne Jail, Australia. We left off last time with some commentary on architecture as it intersects with surveillance. And what I want to discuss for the next few moments is the significance of this design, which is a, an exercise yard. Let me give you some description and then some analysis. The guard would be stationed in the center of this design, the exercise yard, in this compartment here, and one by one, the prisoners would be escorted into each of these compartments. It's almost like a pie. And these various slices of the pie would provide solitary compartments for prisoners who would be allowed to exercise alone. And these partitions are designed to keep these prisoners from communicating with each other. So if they started shouting, hey, Henry, what's going on, dude? The guard in the tower might very well issue a warning with the threat that he would, that the prisoner would be removed from the exercise yard and maybe put in the hole. We'll talk about the hole later. And this is control. This speaks to panopticism. And panopticism is an important paradigm for studying prison design as well as the larger phenomenon of surveillance. To repeat from the previous episode, Michel Foucault suggests that the prison was an early laboratory for the development and diffusion of surveillance, where prisoners were under tight control, like an experiment. They were subjects of an experiment. And the lessons learned in control and surveillance inside a prison would then be exported and replicated in a wider modern society, a modern to postmodern society where surveillance is omniscient. Now, it's very easy to read Foucault and take his word for it and then turn the pages and move on without appreciating Foucault's examination of Jeremy Bentham. Bentham was the initial source of this thinking that prisons could be a laboratory for surveillance. Omniscient, it's everywhere. Panopticism, panopticon is to see everything. And it is Bentham prior to Foucault, who elaborates on the notion of the omniscient deity. God is everywhere. So according to Bentham's design and later Foucault's interpretation, the prisoner would internalize the gaze. He's in this, in this exercise yard, for example, he's staring in front of him the guard tower that represents power, that represents control that can determine the fate of this prisoner in this compartment by banishing him to the hole, barring him from further opportunities to exercise. The partition provides additional control, keeping these prisoners from contaminating each other with profanity or with ideas of escape and so on and so forth. It has bent them who introduces the idea that panopticism in general, and the panopticon in particular as an institution, merges geometry with economics. Geometry, the circle, the cylinder, the roundhouse that is oftentimes called, with economics. You can get away with putting just one guard in this watchtower, and he and he alone is capable of rotating his position, walking around his little station here, 
and examining, inspecting, and sur placing under surveillance each of the prisoners who are placed in these compartments. One, one guard and multiple convicts. Figure out the ratio. It's right there in front of us. Architecture. Architecture matters because it sets the record straight. Now I could talk at length about panopticism and surveillance, but I'm not going to at this time. I will, however, engage in this analysis in this episode, other episodes, and additional lectures. Now, I, I foreshadowed a little bit. If you were paying attention to my, my selection of terms and vocabulary in the previous frame, I used the word contamination. And prisons were built on the notion, even the, oftentimes the unspoken notion of contamination. Here we're going to talk about the slum threat, and I want to throw just a couple of more theoretical ideas at you by way of Emile Durkheim and Mary Douglas, who allow us to understand the depth and significance of pollution. Now, let me do a little bit of description here in the Melbourne jail, the slum threat. Melburnians, as they are affectionately referred to in Australia, in the late 19th century drew a sharp distinction between the grand boulevards of Collins and Burke Streets and the narrow and the nearby narrow lanes and alleys. These they called the back slums. And I study cities, urban ethnography, and that provides a broader context to understand and study prisons in these cities. And Melbourne today is a fascinating city. And you still see remnants of the 19th century with these small lanes, these, 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 these back alleys, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mention that because architecture matters, because it sets the record straight. Let's magnify a little bit more to read this text. Many thought that the underclass of criminals inhabited the rough cottages and seedy hotels of this part of town. Now, mind you, this is a period of Australian history when people lived in hotels. They were residential hotels. Nowadays, a lot of these hotels have been refurbished and opened as music venues and restaurants and so on and so forth. Uh, that's an important part of Australian culture. But in the 19th century, they oftentimes would refer to some of these hotels as seedy, living off the profits of muggings and prostitution. To some extent, this was true, but fears of the criminal class was out of control. They were greatly exaggerated, greatly exaggerated. Moral Panic. Stan Cohen from the London School of Economics. Moral Panic. The overreaction to social problems. Moral Panic. The overreaction. Stan Cohen reminds us that Moral Panic is not suggesting that problems don't exist. Moral Panic suggests that the response the reaction is exaggerated and turbulent. These fears were fueled by the belief that criminal tendencies were inherited. Authorities had a deep and seated fear about the many children of convict parents growing into adulthood in the 1870s and 18, 1870s, 1880s. Even though Victoria, now that's the great state of Victoria. Sydney's in New South Wales. We are now in the great state of Victoria, was never a major destination for transported convicts. That's very important because New South Wales, along with Tasmania, along with Western Australia, were major hubs and destinations for these convict ships. 
Victoria was not. It has a different history, has a different regional identity. It was feared that the dreaded convict stain might easily have infected the colony. Hence, the many calls for the Melbourne jail to play a greater role in punishing larrikins and reforming the criminal classes of the back slums. This is very much an Australian reference. The larrikins, the low lives. You still hear this term in Australia. You will oftentimes see it printed in, in contemporary newspapers to describe a certain shady element of the underclass, these low lives, these larrikins, etc., etc. Michel Foucault, check that. Emile Durkheim, Mary Douglas, pollution. Pollution is a threat. It generates anxiety. And from that anxiety, there is a societal response, oftentimes in building institutions, namely the prison. And here you have the cityscape of Melbourne in the 19th century. The caption gives us a little bit more information. The pan panoramic view of Melbourne in 1880, showing the concentration of churches and businesses, factories and residences in the entire city. The Melbourne jail on the right remains a dominant feature from 1880. So when you talk about cities in the 19th century, in, in Melbourne, for example, churches, businesses are oftentimes mentioned alongside the prison. The prison figures prominently in the cityscape. It figures prominently in the urban experience. And that's why I contextualize my work by studying cities alongside institutions such as prisons. Prisons do not emerge in a vacuum. They emerge in societies, particularly urban societies. All right, I need a cup of coffee and we're going to come back for more.